Okay, thank you everybody. I think we are ready to start today's seminar. I am really delighted and honored to have here Andrea Lodi from Cornell um, to give a talk at the department colloquium. I have printed here a very long page with uh, all of Andrea's accomplishments. I'll just try to give my best summary. Uh, so Andrea is currently a professor at Cornell Tech and, and Technion, uh, but his journey actually started at University of Bologna, where he got his PhD uh, in 2000. And then uh, he went, he was in New York at IBM as a Herman, Herman Goldings Fellow. He went back to Bologna, where he became a full professor until 2015. And then uh, he landed in Canada in 2015 when he was the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Data Science for Real-Time Decision Making at Polytechnique of Montreal. Uh, Andrea is a, a very influential researcher in the world of integer programming and even uh, mixed integer nonlinear programming. He has a lot of uh, publications in top journals uh, in mathematical optimization. He received a number of awards, uh, including a IBM and Google Faculty Award, and most notably the Farkas Prize, which is given by the Informs Optimization Society. So I think it's a, a great honor to have him here today. He will be presenting a recent work about a new branching rule for range minimization programs. So I'd say let's welcome Andrea with a, a, a big clap. <laughs> Looking forward to your seminar. Thank you. So Carla, uh, thank you very much. This is, a, a, of course, a big pleasure to be here. I missed uh, visiting uh, uh, Madison at least a couple of times in which Jeff organized uh, and the group organized wonderful events, MIP and IPCO, so the two of you actually mostly, but, uh, and, um, but finally I made it uh, and then there was a, you guys arranged the wonderful weather, I finally had my Opti beer, uh, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm super happy. So this is uh, uh, the, the topic uh, uh, I will talk about today is indeed uh, uh, going back uh, to my favorite, uh, uh, let's say, integer, uh, specifically integer programming uh, um, uh, work. And, uh, but it's a new work, uh, joint work with a uh, uh, student, uh, former student, uh, uh, gym student in, uh, uh, here in Madison, so Ray, uh, Ray Chen. Uh, now is uh, he was a postdoc uh, uh, with me for three years in New York, and now is at uh, started recently at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, Shenzhen. And uh, uh, Bart von uh, uh, Van Rossum was a student. Uh, is a student. Uh, is finishing now at uh, in Erasmus University in Rotterdam. He visited us for a few months in New York, and then we started this work that I will present today. So this is uh, uh, what I will. Uh, Talk about is uh, uh, motivated by, let's say, these two, two pictures. So on the left, you can see a classical uh, vehicle routing problem in which you have uh, actually four uh, uh, routes, so four vehicles. Uh, in vehicle routing, you have to serve a set of clients starting from the depot, the, 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 um, uh, the routes that you're building. Uh, we have uh, uh, an efficiency objective function, which is the one of minimizing the travel the travel distance. Uh, uh, on the, so the travel distance is uh, 6,178 in some units uh, or whatever it is. And uh, um, what we are caring about uh, as a secondary objective function, uh, if you want, is uh, the uh, range, so which uh, we're going to define as the, different, uh, the difference between the longest route and the shortest route. So we want to be fair with the drivers. Uh, we don't want to charge someone with uh, the the, a very long route uh, and somebody with a very short route uh, because, uh, of course, this situation will lead to some, let's say, unfairness on the treatment because people will finish late, somebody will finish uh, uh, too early. And, um, and so what we're asking here is, uh, uh, can we actually reduce this uh, difference, this range? And uh, this is another solution uh, in which uh, you have still four routes, but in which the difference now is uh, reduced significantly at a, a small price in terms of the, um, uh, the, the, the overall objective function in terms of efficiency. Okay? 
So uh, the range, so is a commonly used uh, objective function in fairness oriented uh, type of optimization and we focus on uh, range minimization. So we would like to find solutions which are uh, with giving uh, in which this range is uh, reduced and is small and uh, uh, in particular uh, without losing too much efficiency, okay? And uh, in particular, uh, we, are, uh, we have in mind some uh, applications uh, in like a cruise scheduling of vehicle routing, uh, like the one I, sh I was showing before, in which uh, uh, this essentially the common uh, uh, algorithm that the people are applying for solving the problem is a column generation. So you are, or branch and price. So the idea is that you have exponentially many uh, columns, so exponentially many uh, partial solutions that are defining your problem, and uh, you're solving this in this way. So uh, the, what I will talk about is designed for applications of this type, and uh, in particular, uh, uh, so we are thinking about exponentially many columns in your problem, and uh, try to see, uh, first of all, how the range minimization is uh, impacting uh, those formulations and, and then of course uh, since I'm proposing uh, something new is uh, a branching rule that try to mitigate, uh, tries to mitigate this uh, uh, let's say potential issue that I will discuss in a second. So uh, intuition wise uh, since we try to mitigate something uh, the, my first, uh, info, the, the first type of uh, uh, let's say message that I'm giving is that uh, range minimization is not uh, uh, coping well uh, with, uh, so those formulations, so uh, column generation formulation are not coping well generally with range minimizations in terms of the LP relaxation. And this can be seen very uh, easily from this example. So in this case, uh, it's again a vehicle routing and each one of those uh, is uh, uh, essentially um, is a, a vehicle or a driver, D1 to D5. And uh, so what you have here is uh, 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 potentially the, di the uh, def different routes. So for uh, the driver number one, so this is the LP relaxation of the, of the problem uh, in which you assume to have included constraints for range minimization. So this is the LP relaxation and each one of those bars here are uh, the the, uh, let's say, uh, different routes which are covered by the, the particular driver, right? I mean, of course, any driver will cover only one route, but in the LP relaxation will cover more routes. And uh, the size of the bar uh, is telling you how much, uh, essentially, between zero and one, how much is covering that particular route. So those three, those four bars in this particular case are summing up to one. And so that's uh, the uh, overall split of the LP relaxation. And uh, so they go very from this one, which is actually the, the on this uh, direction is the, the length of the route. So this route is very short. This one is very long. And uh, the thing is that uh, if you take an average of the routes, a weighted average, you can see that the, essentially the, uh, for every one in the LP relaxation of this problem, for every one of the drivers or for every one of the vehicles, essentially the, the length is the same, okay? So which means that uh, minimization wise, if we are taking the minimum, uh, the between, we are taking the maximum uh, length uh, of, uh, of a driver minus the minimum length of the same driver, so this is equal to zero, which of course is the wonderful solution that you want to achieve, except that when you look at it in practice, uh, the situation is far from being actually equi equitable, right? I mean, it's like when you have to turn it into an integer solution, this is not going to be the same. So uh, somehow this is, uh, I will try to convince you that this is actually happening in pretty much every uh, practical uh, uh, um, uh, formulations that you can write for range minimizations associated with uh, uh, column generation, and uh, I will try to give you an intuition of how you can go a little bit farther than that. So um, the, the, what we are, uh, for mitigating this uh, source of weakness, uh, we are trying to look into range uh, branching, so a specialized branching rule that is taking this into account. It's not uh, designed for uh, uh, vehicle routing or for any other problem, but it's a general framework that is only uh, uh, I mean, um, uh, associated with the fact of having a formulation that, that is actually looking at range minimization. So the uh, out, uh, uh, outline of the talk is that I will, uh, um, looking in this branching rule, I will derive some uh, theoretical properties, evaluate the performance, and looking at some extension to, uh, that go uh, beyond uh, um, 
range minimization, but some uh, more complicated problems. So now, uh, this is the problem that we're facing, and uh, this is not any more vehicle routing here. Here is, uh, we have uh, the set of feasible solutions. You have some linear relaxation, uh, uh, linear constraints and uh, binary variables, so it's exponential. And I assume that this N, uh, capital N, is large. So every, uh, we have an exponentially large set of uh, variables, uh, binary variables uh, that are telling me if I take that particular column or not. And uh, for each one of those columns, there is a payoff, uh, which is, can be the, the, in this particular case, for the vehicle routing was the length of the, the route, and uh, that we I call PI. And immediately I can define what is actually the maximum and the minimum here, saying that PI, uh, so P max of X, given a solution X, is the maximum among the XI, which are uh, stricter, uh, strictly bigger than zero, of the payoff PI. And the uh, same thing for the minimum is the same thing. So the maximum and minimum payoff. So now we are formulating this problem, say, like uh, in this way. So we are taking uh, the minimum over this set of feasible solutions defined by the linear inequality and the integrality binary requirements uh, over the minimum, uh, over the difference between P max and P min. Okay? And uh, I'm assuming that uh, AX uh, greater, less or equal than B, so here, I'm including some uh, efficiency perspective. So I assume that I know that I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, let's say, I want to be fair, but I don't want to lose too much in terms of the quality of the solution associated with some efficiency perspective. So in vehicle routing will be, I don't want to, if I know the optimal solution of shortest possible sum of the routes, I don't want to go like more than 10% of that amount. Okay, something like this. So now, um, again, large number of columns uh, and uh, um, problem specific exact branching <laughs> schemes exist. So the only assumption I'm making here is that the payoff can be efficiently incorporating in the pricing problem. So I'm able to actually deal with uh, uh, the pricing problem in which I modify AX less or equal than B in order to take into account uh, the fact that I now have to write down uh, P max and P min. So I have to write down the minimum and the maximum this payoff. And, uh, um, uh, and essentially that range con uh, branching induces constraints limiting the domain of P. So we, of course we want to uh, work on a situation in which uh, the, those range constraints will affect the overall objective function in this way. So now, what is range uh, branching about? So I needed this definition first. So now let me, the definition that I had me before of P min and P max was generic. So I didn't say anything about, uh, but uh, you can assume that it was actually associated with integer, right? I mean, there's a column which is uh, decided and then I take uh, the, the cost or the payoff of that particular column. Here I'm extending this uh, to the fractional situation is that uh, I don't care if xi uh, is taken completely, uh, provided that that particular column is taken at least uh, epsilon, I, I, the, this counts as a full uh, payoff for that particular uh, uh, column. And so p min and p max are defined in this way. And then I, I'm going to define the, what is called the range uh, respecting solution. So it's a solution X bar, let's say, and then I have eta and gamma. Eta and gamma are my two uh, variables that are representing uh, the minimum and the maximum. And then I'm saying that uh, a solution which is range respecting is a solution in which uh, eta bar is uh, uh, greater or equal than P max or, uh, of X bar and uh, gamma bar is less or equal than P min of X bar. So essentially I'm saying if I'm using eta and gamma as variables that are uh, uh, capturing the maximum and the minimum, the maximum has to be bigger than or equal to actually the, uh, the column that has the largest payoff and, uh, the, uh, um, and gamma has to be less or equal to the, va the, the variable uh, than the, the, the column that has the smallest payoff which is means just saying that, uh, of course, uh, the difference between uh, uh, eta bar and gamma bar uh, is, uh, uh, I mean, I want this uh, uh, eta bar and gamma bar to be on the one side greater or equal, on the one side smaller than equal, but as close as possible to those in such a way that they are uh, well approximating uh, my solution. Um, 
So a range violating solution, uh, of course, underestimates uh, the true objective value. And if I go back to my original picture here, of course, uh, this is a situation in which the minimum and maximum will be equal to each other. And of course, it will be clearly not respecting the situation because the maximum one is this one and the value here is going to be smaller. And the maximum, uh, the minimum one uh, is going to be this one and the value is going to be bigger. So this is clearly not range respecting, okay? So now, uh, what do I do at this point? Uh, well, the situation is that uh, uh, I want to branch uh, instead of uh, the favorite, uh, the specific branching rule which is associated to that particular, to the problem that you want to solve. I want to first, uh, the, my order of business is that I, was, I want to first turn my solution into a range respecting a fractional solution. And after that, starting to do the usual thing that I would do for, uh, for this. Uh, in the theoretical part of this uh, talk, so in, uh, in a few slides, so what I will tell you is that when this happens, so well, how much uh, range uh, violating solutions appear in classical formulations, uh, and uh, uh, somehow uh, what is the, the, say, the properties that I, uh, the range branching is, uh, is uh, obtaining. But, be, but before doing that, uh, I would like to just uh, see what range branching does. And the, the thing is, uh, is relatively easy. So let's assume uh, a range violating solution in which uh, eta bar is uh, smaller than P max, strictly smaller than P max. So it's, it's range violating in the sense that uh, it's actually inside the, the right border. And so uh, they take uh, capital U, which is uh, in between the eta bar and uh, P max of X bar. And I branch uh, by building uh, two nodes, uh, two child nodes. The first one is saying uh, eta is less or equal than u. And the second one is eta greater or equal than u. So now, uh, the first reaction, uh, your first reaction will be, well, this doesn't cut off anything, right? I mean, it's like a less or equal, eta or equal, there is something in between. But it's not the value of eta. Here I'm saying uh, this, I'm taking something which is in this uh, interval. And when I say eta less or equal than u, automatically I can enforce some valid constraints which are saying that all the, the columns which have a payoff which is strictly bigger than u, then they have to go to zero, okay? And on the other side, the other uh, node, I'm saying, well, immediately if eta must be greater or equal than u, and before was eta, uh, eta bar, then I can immediately say that the new solution is going to be at least u, and so I'm moving at the lower bound of the LP relaxation. So let me show you in a pictorial way. So let's assume that we are here. So I'm violating this constraint, and P max is this one, and eta bar is here. So I take a U, which is between P max and, uh, and uh, eta bar, so I mean eta bar and P max. And so the first child will say, P4 and P5, so the, the uh, X4 uh, and X5, so the, uh, the variable 4 and variable 5, which have uh, strictly bigger uh, um, payoffs than, uh, than U, uh, has to be set to 0. So uh, the sum of those X must be set to 0, which means that all the X must be equal to 0 because they are non-negative variables. And so I'm actually uh, do a propagation based on forcing constraints. And on the other side, immediately what I get is that the new eta bar is going to be u, right? I mean, because I need to force the value to something else. So I need to find another solution, which is, of course is going to be a combination of other x's, but this in which the objective is going to be, uh, I mean, the eta is going to be larger. So this is uh, simple, so nothing particularly fancy, but uh, uh, somehow uh, has uh, uh, quite a nice effect that I will, uh, I will show you in a second. Uh, but the idea is, uh, uh, I mean, summarizing, um, I have a problem which is actually in, um, solved by column generation. So every column uh, has a certain payoff, and I want to minimize the difference between the maximum and the minimum of these payoffs. And then uh, what I, I have some constraints that are actually mm, somehow uh, um, and new variables in my problem that are uh, uh, formulating uh, this uh, relationship between the maximum and the minimum. And I, uh, what I'm claiming is that in order to avoid 
situations in which there are solutions uh, um, like uh, uh, solution x bar, the original variable, eta and gamma that are not range uh, respecting, I can branch on those solutions and I can, be, I can turn it, uh, them into range respecting by doing this. So how, how much I can uh, hope for this approach? So, um, of course, it will be depending on the formulation. But what I have here is something like this, okay? So what I call a valid formulation, so here is that my original problem, ax less or equal than b, and the, the binary requirement on the variables. Let's assume that I have two sets, it can be one set only, but I have two sets of constraints that are defining my minimum and maximum of the payoff, okay? So now the entire, uh, let's say, formulation is characterized by the uh, uh, original set, uh, let's say, uh, plus uh, this uh, C and uh, whatever else that I route in the formulation. And uh, I can claim that it's a valid formulation for the range minimization problem if the solution Z, which is associated with the X variables, so the original variables in my problem, eta and, uh, and gamma, is feasible for this problem. And uh, 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 it's going to be feasible for this problem if and only if it respects the original set of constraints and uh, is, it is range respecting, right? I mean, that's a trivial thing. So the definition is that if it, doesn't, if it is not range respecting, that is gonna, not going to be a feasible solution. So any valid formulation that you can think of for your favorite problem has to be implemented in such a way that those constraints are making it range respecting. So this is, a, I will call a W, a valid formulation uh, for my problem. And uh, unfortunately, the, best, the first result is a kind of negative and tells you that uh, what is a weak uh, valid formulation? So a formulation in which, uh, essentially, uh, the, if I take uh, the LP relaxation of the formulation itself, then uh, the, uh, any, uh, essentially, uh, uh, any solution which is uh, range respecting but is fractional is also actually feasible for the LP relaxation. Okay, so this is telling me that, uh, in a certain sense, uh, that I would like to, to uh, writing uh, inequalities which are making automatically range respecting the constraints, but instead, uh, everything that range respecting, uh, and sorry, that are making range respecting solutions integral, but what I'm showing in uh, this definition is that a a, a, a mo the formulations generally have this property. Even if uh, they, get, they get a solution which is range respecting, uh, and is fractional, this is going to be feasible for my LP relaxation. So informally, this means that a valid formulation is weak uh, when it admits all fractional range respecting solutions. So if a solution is range respecting but is fractional, it's not cut off by, this, by the set of constraints that I added here. So those constraints are not helping in cutting into fractional solutions. And uh, somehow, in order to get a sense of this, uh, think about that, uh, um, that if, it would not be the, if it was not the case, uh, if the regular constraints, a, uh, uh, the, 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 the constraints that I added here, so 1C and 1D, would be able, uh, were able to actually cut off fractional solutions, then I can immediately put them into a x less or equal b and b and I strengthen the formulation without needing them too much. So in other words, we argue that any formulation of practical use in which you need to add extra constraints in order to actually take into account the range minimization is going to be weak, containing a lot of fractional solutions which are range respecting. However, this is not even the worst uh, thing that can happen. The worst thing that can happen is that uh, I have a proposition here that is telling me that uh, any valid uh, formulation holds that the uh, uh, ZLP, so the, the value of the LP relaxation, con uh, or uh, the, say, the, the, the value of the relaxation, but the LP relaxation contains infinitely many also range violating fractional solutions. So the point is that those constraints are, I mean, at the end is a valid relaxation if once I turn it into an integer solution, that integer solution is going to be range respecting. But if I take any combination of two solutions, it's easy to build any convex combination of solutions that are actually range violating, but is still feasible for my LP relaxation. So uh, what I'm trying to argue here is that, uh, unfortunately, the practical uh, uh, formulations uh, of the problems uh, in which we add the range uh, 
constraints, range minimization constraints, are uh, uh, kind of uh, structurally weak because uh, the constraints that we are adding uh, do not help in cutting off integer solutions. And at the same time, we, we can build a, a bunch of fractional solutions uh, that are actually violating uh, the range inequalities, which is bad. Uh, so this means that uh, uh, the, what can we expect now from uh, the branching that we, I'm, I'm proposing, right? I mean, so essentially what I, I'll, uh, I'm trying to convince you is, uh, unfortunately, if you start by your nice formulation and you add, uh, and, and then you change the objective function and you try to do range minimization, you're going to add uh, auxiliary constraints and variables, and uh, this formulation be, will become likely very weak. And uh, the only tool I have now is range branching, uh, how, how much I can get with the range branching, right? So in order to uh, look into this from uh, the methodological perspective, I'm saying uh, a range branching free node solution is saying, okay, I branched a bunch of times on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, range constraint, uh, sorry, uh, range, uh, I'm do I did a bunch of times range branching. So I get a node in the branch and bound in which the range, now this is a range respecting a fractional solution. And uh, uh, of course, uh, the first result is that uh, this is, uh, uh, if that node is, uh, uh, so if I don't have any more branching that in order to kill the range uh, um, violation, then this solution that I'm obtaining is a range respecting solution. And the, uh, what I'm obtaining here is that this range and expecting solution will still be feasible for any LP relaxation of any, any valid formulation for your problem. So which means that it's going to be bigger or equal to any LP relaxation uh, of the problem itself. So which means that the best uh, node uh, value that you obtain uh, by doing uh, the range uh, uh, branching is going to be at least as good to the best possible formulation that you can think of, uh, LP relaxation of the formulations that you can think of, valid formulations that you can think of. Okay? So these are, uh, I mean, easy and, I mean, kind of simple results, but are telling us that uh, in our strategy, which is uh, doing a range branching, you're going to get to some nodes uh, in your tree that have a stronger linear programming relaxations with respect to any other type of formulation that you can think of, which is a valid formulation, okay? So, which uh, somehow gives us the intuition that something can go on, can go, that can be useful. So, uh, there are a few uh, practical considerations related to this. Maybe uh, one consideration from the computational standpoint is that you don't want to uh, branch on, uh, uh, let's say, um, violations which are too small. Maybe you want to start uh, in a layered way by branching on, constra or on uh, range constraints which are strong, very violated, and then reducing the violation over and over. Um, and uh, um, and uh, somehow, the, because the goal is to jump as much as possible to a point in the branching in which you have a, a very good LP relaxation for your problem, and at that point, uh, switching to the regular branching. And uh, uh, let's try to see if this is actually happening for uh, uh, some uh, practical uh, uh, applications. So I go back to my capacitative vehicle routing problem. And uh, before describing the problem properly, let me go back to my, um, to my uh, uh, original, uh, let's say, motivating picture in a certain sense. So I had, uh, this is the root node of uh, this uh, uh, VRP with uh, five vehicles and in which uh, the LP relaxation is telling me that everything is indistinguishable, right? I mean, the LP relaxation is telling me that everybody is paying exactly the same in each one of the routes. As soon as I do one single branching, so one single uh, uh, branching on, uh, um, uh, let's say, range branching, the good news is that what I get is that I already split, right? I mean, it's like if I branch once, uh, I already getting something here which is fixed, so I cannot take any one of those guys which were bigger than a certain amount. So here I am in this situation. And now I can start seeing some differences. So instead of having the minimum 
the maximum minus the minimum equal to zero, what I get is that the, this is gonna be the minimum, this is gonna be the maximum, and I already have a range, okay? And if I keep doing this uh, for a while, this is gonna be, of course, uh, not, uh, uh, so a node somewhere in the tree, so not necessarily the, the, let's say, the best lower bound, but the good news is that you're, you're shrinking very much the solution space, right? I mean, now you have a situation in which this is the maximum, this is the minimum, uh, is uh, the distance with respect to what I had before is uh, slightly bigger than the one that I had in the, previous, uh, uh, in the previous picture, but the good news is that all this dashed area is an, is, uh, are areas are areas in which uh, I cannot, uh, I mean, I, uh, I have uh, hard constraints for which I cannot go on anymore. So I'm actually reducing the solution space significantly. So now, uh, let me just uh, uh, jump back. So to talk about this uh, fair capacitative vehicle routing. So it's a classical vehicle routing. So you have a set of customers uh, and uh, K identical uh, vehicles with the same capacity. Uh, is a symmetric matrix uh, with cost Cij, and I have a maximum uh, uh, overall route cost, uh, which is equal to capital B, which is the constraint that I have to uh, satisfy in order to not paying too much in terms of uh, efficiencies, losing too much in terms of efficiency. So uh, uh, given all feasible routes, uh, capital R, uh, those uh, which are starting, so they are feasible because they are stunting and ending at the depot, they are respecting the vehicle capacities and uh, they are not exceeding the maximum allowed total cost. A feasible solution consists of this subset R that covers all the customer's demand, classical vehicle routing. And we want, of course, uh, the feasible solution that minimizes the range. So let's see two formulations. So what I will try to show you in uh, the computational experiments on this problem is that uh, uh, the range branching is benefiting uh, any formulation you can think of. Uh, I mean, this is a bit too much. At least the two formulations that you can think of of this problem, which are currently the, the formulations that the people have been using in the literature. So this formulation is called the vehicle index formulation, in which uh, you have uh, your, our uh, well-known uh, uh, eta and gamma. And uh, here, uh, these are the constraints that we had before in order to say that the eta is going to be greater or equal than uh, the, the, largest, uh, uh, the largest payoff. And here we have variable XRK means uh, that are variables that are telling if route R is performed by vehicle K. So it's a big formulation. Uh, and of course, uh, the situation is R is already exponential. Now I have exponential times the number of vehicles, so which is actually is a big formulation. Here, uh, this is the constraints for saying that I'm covering uh, each one of the clients. Uh, this is the overall cost of the routes uh, here, uh, less or equal than B. Here, I'm saying that every vehicle is doing only one route, and these are the constraints, artificial constraints that I use for modeling the maximum and the minimum of the payoff, which in this case is the length of the route. So there is another formulation which has been proposed in the literature uh, for dealing with this particular problem specifically, and it is called the last customer formulation. The idea behind the scene, so this one has less variables because you have one variable per route, so it's still large, but uh, it's actually less than before because we're not duplicating over the number of uh, vehicles. And the idea behind the scene here is that this BIR means uh, if uh, the uh, client I, so customer I, is the last client in the, uh, in the um, uh, route R, okay? So th for every route that starts at the depot and go back, uh, goes back at the depot, there's just a, there is a last customer. And so BIR is not a variable, but it's just a binary, uh, binary parameter that says zero if R, uh, I is not the last customer for R, and, uh, and uh, one otherwise. So here, you have the same thing as before. Every client is, uh, is covered. The cost uh, of, uh, the overall cost of the routes that are selected is less or equal than B. I have to select exactly K routes because they have K, uh, uh, K um, um, vehicles. And here, Eta is telling me, okay, this is the, among the routes which are uh, selected, 
I will only take into account those in which I is the, the last customer, right? I mean, it's like in which B is going to be one. So I have one constraint now for each of the customers. And this is enough to, mod to take into account the maximum payoff. For the minimum, it's slightly more complicated in the sense that uh, since it is a minimum and so has to be, uh, gamma has to be less or equal than this one, in order to guarantee the feasibility of these constraints, uh, that I needed to, go up, uh, to use a big M uh, uh, constraint that says that, of course, if uh, for this particular uh, client, uh, uh, customer I, this is actually uh, uh, zero, then uh, this constraint is automatically satisfied. So if I, so for that, for, for all the routes, uh, uh, the, for all the routes uh, which are uh, taken into account, uh, I is never the last customer of the route, then uh, this uh, sum is equal to zero, so this is going to be equal to M, and M is going to be greater, M is a, v a large value for which is going to be greater or equal than gamma. So it's actually a valid formulation for my problem. So this is a weak formulation. It's relatively easy to see. You can construct as many examples as you want in which the LP relaxation is range respecting but is actually fractional and or a range, um, a range violating and is also fractional. So there are uh, pretty bad. So now uh, the, I can uh, uh, tell you that uh, the two assumptions that I made before, so the assumption that I can incorporate this into uh, the pricing uh, is uh, relatively easy to do, and then so we can use uh, standard branching once uh, range uh, uh, branching is, uh, is over, so that I don't need to do, I don't, I, I, the solution is ranging, uh, is range uh, uh, free, range, uh, this, the, the node is uh, range violating free, or whatever. And that, so these are the three uh, pictures that I already shown, but these are the results that we can get. So we have, uh, uh, unfortunately, for range minimization, the first information is uh, for people which are a little bit familiar with uh, vehicle routing. Uh, nowadays, we can solve problems, so vehicle routing problems with 100 customers. Uh, I wouldn't say not easily, but uh, somehow under customers is uh, uh, relatively under control. Here, uh, we can go up to 25, and that's already tough. The two formulation, classical vehicle formulation, the first one, or customer formulation, the second one. So for 15 customers only, they can solve problems pretty much uh, well. But uh, as soon as you go to 25, uh, they both uh, uh, formulations, so the customer and the vehicle formulation, so this number here and this, they fail in one hour of computing time to solve the problem by even implementing the best column generation that you have. Okay. So it's difficult. However, as soon as uh, you empower those formulation with range branching, and so you do range branching uh, until you can, and, and then you switch to actually regular branching, then uh, this, uh, you can see a significant uh, in increase, uh, improvement of the formulation itself. So if we take, for example, 20, so the classical uh, formulation, the vehicle formulation, the first one solves only nine problems, and uh, you can get to 16 problems. And uh, the customer formulation is solving only one instance uh, over 20. Instead, uh, as soon as you put the, the range branching inside, you can solve 19 over, over 20 of them. So uh, you can solve all the problems of size 15 uh, faster. Uh, this is the gap that you attain at the end. Uh, here, actually, the gap is zero, which means that the only one uh, instance we cannot prove optimality in one hour, but it's essentially is done. And uh, here, uh, you go back to a, you go down to a 5.8 percent uh, gap at the end, uh, even if six over 20 instances you cannot solve to optimality. So these results are telling us that, uh, I mean, this is useful in both formulations. This formulation, the range for the uh, customer formulation, when you start to become uh, um, let's say, for example, for 20 years is actually worse uh, than, uh, than the other one. There are situations in which it can be slightly better, but over uh, uh, all in all, uh, the, the, good, the, the thing is that the customer formulation is worse than the classical formulation, but with the range, with the range uh, uh, branching is becoming actually better, which is uh, somehow interesting to know. Uh, this last column is... Uh, um, the improvement uh, over uh, the uh, best uh, 
the most efficient solution. So the most efficient solution can be improved in terms of uh, uh, fairness of up to, for example, here, um, let's say 40, 54%. So you're getting something which is uh, not too far from uh, the most efficient solution, but with uh, actually 54% better in terms of fairness, uh, the difference between the two. Um, so here another picture, uh, which I think is uh, interesting. So with uh, uh, 25, uh, size of 25, 25 customers, uh, this is actually what we have in uh, the, uh, uh, the vehicle formulation or customer formulation. The, on top uh, uh, here, we have the classical branching. If you don't do range branching, so this is the lower bound, this is the upper bound, big gap left. This one uh, in which you do the uh, range branching uh, lower bound and range branching upper bound, I mean, and, and of course the, the effect of the upper bound as well, is that you get a much uh, smaller gap, even if it cannot solve it to optimality in one hour. When you do the customer formulation, uh, this gap becomes even smaller. Recall that at the end I have a 5.8% gap overall. And I can solve 14 over 20 of the instances. So now, uh, the, in the last few minutes, uh, I, what I will do is that I will tell you that I can go a little bit farther than that, uh, which is the, what is called order branching. So the, the um, uh, range branching is uh, just uh, uh, I'm taking uh, the highest payoff and the, sm and the smallest, uh, the largest and the smallest, and I do the difference. Order is... Uh, 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 in order-based minimization, we minimize the weighted sum of the ordered payoffs uh, of exactly k selected columns. So for the vehicle routing would be, okay, I'm ordering the, uh, the, the payoff, so the length of the routes uh, from the top to the bottom, and then I give a weight to each one of them, and I want to minimize this. So is this uh, somehow interesting? Uh, in data science, this is called the Gini deviation. So in the Gini deviation, you indeed, uh, what you're going to do is that you sum the pairwise difference between uh, uh, the payoff or any value that you can think of, of, uh, of the k uh, different uh, values on your, uh, uh, on your vector, and uh, which is this formula here. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, zk is, uh, um, of z, uh, let's say z of x, is denotes the vector of ordered payoffs um, uh, of selected columns. So essentially here we are enlarging the problem by saying that uh, I have to select exactly K of, uh, of the columns, uh, which is coming for free in the vehicle routing, but it cannot be the same situation. Here is a generic problem in which I, I select K columns, and those K columns are in such a way that I want to minimize this uh, objective function which is exactly the Gini deviation, and the problem becomes like this. So W uh, transpose times Z, and Z are the artificial variables uh, before where uh, eta and gamma now are these variables that are telling me the order in which the, the values are put. And uh, um, the extension of uh, range minimization, uh, range uh, branching is uh, relatively uh, easy. So... Um, uh, you define the concept of uh, order respecting. So the, the, before uh, the situation was like a, a range uh, uh, respecting or range violating. So the maximum was uh, uh, smaller than the real uh, maximum among the columns which are selected. Here, the same thing happens, but instead of having only the extreme, you have the minimum. Uh, so instead of having the only the minimum and the maximum, you are taking this for each one of the ordered values, and you have to define the order respecting solution, which is the one in which the, number, the entry number five is actually greater or equal to the, 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 the uh, fifth, uh, let's say, largest uh, um, uh, payoff. And uh, you branch on the Z variables to el eliminate this order violation, and the good news is that, uh, I mean, you have some freedom on deciding which one, so there will be probably many that are uh, uh, violated, but you have to some, um, uh, let's say, freedom in deciding which one you want to branch on. And uh, the variable fixing, uh, the good news is that variable fixing, which uh, in the range case uh, 
range branching case was happening only on the node in which you're imposing eta to be, um, let's say, uh, less or equal than u is actually happening in, uh, in, uh, in both sides, so in both nodes. And uh, these are some uh, uh, additional experiments uh, uh, also on the uh, capacitated vehicle routing with the Gini deviation. Uh, the classical formulation uh, is uh, already for 15 uh, 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 clients is not able, I have only one formulation here, so only uh, this, this solves the 17 of the problems in uh, roughly 1,100 seconds. Uh, you can go to 20 over 20 in 2 seconds uh, 0.9 only. Uh, this is the improvement in terms of the quality of the solution. Number of branch and bound nodes goes uh, really down. Uh, 20 is also very effective. Uh, and 25, uh, you don't solve all the problems to optimality, but still a significant 60% of them is actually solved to optimality. So I'm, I've been going very fast, surprisingly. Okay, Jeff, that has attended many of my talks, I don't go fast in general. No, yeah, <laughs> I'm surprised that you didn't know that. So, um, so conclusion here is uh, the range branching uh, somehow seems to be a reasonable and effective way for uh, um, for uh, taking into account those problems in which uh, you want to introduce some fairness. Um, this is particularly appealing uh, in the context of this column generation framework. And, uh, um, and it leads to a, a good speed up for solving uh, problems in which there is actually this uh, branch and price uh, um, going on. Um, in particular, the situation is... Uh, uh, that uh, uh, this is easy to incorporate in branch and price. So somehow the, what you have is uh, that the pricing problem or finding the most violated uh, the column with the most uh, negative reduced cost is, uh, doesn't change too much with respect to what you had before. The imposition uh, imposing those constraints will not lead to any uh, particularly complicated situation can be extended for taking into account slightly more complicated versions of the problem in which uh, you take, for example, ordered, uh, uh, order based minimization. So like uh, one example is uh, the Gini deviation. Um, from a, a future work perspective, we have been looking at this uh, uh, for, uh, I mean, certainly there is more work to do in order to uh, improve this part. Uh, so this part is the upper bound, so the primal solutions, uh, which are, mm, uh, let's say, naturally becoming for this particular problem better, but we're not taking into account anything. We're not doing anything specific to make uh, this curve going down, um, this trajectory to go uh, uh, down as much as possible. The good news is that here, uh, uh, let's say here, here uh, the, um, we're still not too far away. For example, in the only problem in which we are not solving the problem to optimality, we don't have a guarantee of solving the problem to optimality, still the gap is very small, so somehow, or even zero. So somehow there is a room for improvement. We don't know how much. Uh, the next step potentially would be to look into the mean max or uh, uh, max mean type of objective function, which, uh, which is an open problem uh, we don't know. Uh, what to do. Um, yes, so there are a few references, and this is actually another problem that we were uh, looking into, uh, and we have results on the paper. This is a generalized assignment problem. I think that this is uh, what is uh, kind of interesting uh, in this case. I will not to go into the details, but the idea is you have M jobs to assign to N agents, and then, of course, uh, the classical uh, is not a one-to-one -one assignment, but is a generalized assignment. The interesting thing here is, uh, uh, this is the formulation, and the interesting thing of these results uh, are uh, showing uh, the solving uh, mixed integer linear programming form. So for the generalized assignment, uh, the column generation is not the favorite choice. So you don't go, you will not go solving the problem by column generation. You will definitely do this uh, regular MIP. But the interesting thing is that uh, the, if you do instead branch and price uh, on range minimization, this is not going to be very effective. But if you do range branching on the branch and price formulation, 
so the extended uh, uh, space formulation, then this becomes the best possible method for solving the problem. Okay? So this uh, somehow indicates, uh, and uh, we don't have enough results, that's why I'm saying uh, that there's a more identical situation, is this seems to indicate that uh, you can even change the type of formulation of the problem that you want to use, provided that you have this additional tool, which is bra range branching, and then uh, this is going to become, uh, so somehow, original, let's say, the original formulation is a MIP formulation, the alternative formulation is a branch and price formulation, on the original problem, one is actually better than the other. In uh, the range minimization problem, provided that the column generation formulation is empowered by the uh, additional uh, range branching, uh, this is actually the picture flips. And then you, the picture flips and then the column generation becomes more effective, which I don't know if uh, we can generalize this type of results, but for this problem is actually happening. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Are there questions for Andrea? Hi, Professor. I want to know what's the key challenge you met uh, when you improve the rules and uh, uh, what's the key challenge is to prove the property or somewhere? Well, uh, here the, the theoretical uh, part of the results are relatively easy. It's not a, uh, the challenge here is to make uh, everything. So this part is, uh, um, I mean, I think it's relatively nice because it gives a theoretical ground on the fact that, that this is going to be better than, uh, than not. But uh, I, have, I mean, pro from a, uh, admittedly, what we started from is from a practical perspective, try to see how to improve the solutions, and then we came up with this. So from a practical perspective, the complication is uh, on making uh, this branching interacting correctly with everything, because the column generation framework is generally a, a complex framework in which there is a lot of uh, software, uh, um, I mean, pieces that are uh, talking to each other. So that part is actually not particularly trivial. and. Bart did an ex exceptional work in, uh, in doing this. Yes. More questions. Jim. Yeah, actually, speaking of the details of the column generation implementation, I'm curious about the, the pricing problem. Like, it, it seems not so obvious to me that that would be easy to adapt. Like, for example, if you have the lower bound on the, the, the sum of the prices, is, does it change in some way, or, or is it? It's a, it, 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 so you're branching on this on these extra variables. The influence uh, on the x variables, so you know that in branch and price, the problem is that if you, if you impose on the x variables some strange constraints, then actually this propagates badly on that part. Here we are instead, uh, I mean, what we are currently doing is that in the in the, let's say, less or equal version, we are fixing variables. So fixing variable to zero doesn't change anything. On the other side, we are just imposing something on this extra variable, which is the eta variable or uh, the, the, um, the gamma variable. So eventually, this is uh, kind of uh, almost transparent with respect to what is happening later on. Because you are acting mostly on, uh, on those constraints, essentially, these ones which are not involved with the X too much. Okay, so it's a, yeah. it's a kind of, a, uh, like, I mean, a nice, uh, let's say, byproduct of branching in that particular way. I think it, the powerful part is actually this part of the branching in which you are fixing variable to zero. So you're not having the fixing variable to zero and fixing variable to one, which would create some anomaly. Yeah, so that's the part that is maybe, but I think I maybe, I mean, when you fix that to zero, that means you also cannot generate further columns, right, that would violate that at that yes. point. And so that you have to remember in the pricing problem, but I assume because of this form of it, it it's yes. relatively easy. Yes, yeah, okay. it's relatively easy, yes. More questions for Andrea? I actually, I, I, I'm actually, I was scared about giving yeah, this I talk. No, I was scared about this, giving this talk because to me, this one looks uh, simple. So it's a simple idea. So I, I always expect uh, somebody like Jeff coming in and said, well, this has been done 20 years oh. ago. And <laughs> so you, did you miss that? <laughs> so did you see anything similar to that? I'm asking questions to yeah, the audience. Yeah, no, now. I don't think so. <laughs> 
national policy that you care about fairness until recently, and that's then it makes it yeah. much harder. But my question, just so I think I try to understand, so what happens if, like, so what's so special about doing this in Branch and Price? Why can't I do, I know I could also do range, or I, I can also sort of think, conf I might have to add some auxiliary variables, but I can also do range branching in the original space of variables. And so, like, are you saying that that, is there some one of your lemmas saying that that's a, in that particular context, it's particularly weak, and you get the strength, because when you, when you the, have a column generation uh, framework, you yes, fix things to zero, the, the, or? What I'm trying to say, and I, this, I think there is more work to be done in that direction, but uh, what I'm trying to say is that the deterioration that we are observing from a good, so we know that column generation formulations are generally very tight for this type of problems. And so the LP relaxation is becoming very tight. So now, as soon as you are actually those adding uh, those uh, uh, range requirements, the formulation becomes terrible. And so because of this big difference, uh, you can uh, influence this a lot. So now, is it true, and together with the fact that it doesn't become too hard, uh, actually, to take those constraints into account. So now, what happens if... Uh, you doing this in regular uh, uh, MIP formulations. Uh, uh, the, I, I, so for the generalized uh, assignment problem, uh, for example, uh, uh, we've, we found more, nat actually, it, it's kind of interesting that the column generation formulation became, became actually easier in a certain sense than the other one. I don't know how to adapt that thing uh, to, uh, to the situation of just branching. Uh, we tried some, something, but the just branching on the, uh, on the MIP version of the generalized assignment in that way didn't seem to be effective. Are there more questions? Okay, then let's thank Andrea again. Thank you. So questo di Cass... Oh, oh Kelly. A te. Io ce l'ho una domanda. Dai, volentieri. Mi ha fatto pensare a quello che ha detto della combinazione convessa, cioè che praticamente puoi avere una cosa che è range violating anche se dentro la combinazione convessa delle soluzioni intere che sono range... Uh, il contrario di violating. Respect. Respecting. E questo, cioè... La, immagino dipenda dalla definizione di T-min e T-max. Sì, dipende dal fatto che stai facendo. Dipende dal fatto che nel T-min e T-max quello che stai facendo è, 